and the change that's been made that will allow uh, the introduction of security certificate evidence without uh, disclosing that it was obtained by torture. This is a legal analysis that no one else in Canada has yet heard. Uh, Donald Galloway has submitted it to uh, some papers as an opinion piece. I hope it gets published. I'll be raised in Parliament. Most of us who have been studying C-51 from the day that it was uh, tabled have been focusing on the earlier parts of the bill. Uh, first of all, let me read you the full title of Bill C-51. I'll cover the dots that Donald didn't get to. Um, it's, quote, an act, an act to enact the Security of Canada Information Sharing Act, excellent. the Secure Air Travel Act, to amend the criminal code, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service Act, and the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, and to make related and consequential amendments to other acts. It is, in fact, an omnibus bill. It's difficult to get through all of it, and up until now, we've been so indebted to law professors who've been, as I've been, diving into parts one through four, and then we all have gotten to part five, the, uh, the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act bit, and thought, somebody who understands immigration and refugee law better dive into this. And thank God Donald did, because this is an analysis that nobody else has heard, and we're going to have to get this out as well. Uh, when Stephen Harper launched this bill, I don't know if you know, it was not launched in Parliament. It was launched at a campaign-style rally in Richmond Hill, Ontario, in which Stephen Harper said, and I quote, violent jihadism is not a human right. It is an act of war, unquote. I don't know if the Prime Minister's language could get any more reckless or dangerous or ill-informed, but the two law professors with whom I've been working a lot and who are, I think, every Canadian should be grateful, uh, Professor Kent Roach is a law professor at the University of Toronto, Craig Forsyth is at the University of Ottawa, and by the grace of God, they're both on sabbatical. They have done nothing but, but work on C-51. Julian Santino 
shall rise again. And then he puts in brackets, and if that isn't a terrorizing thought, I don't know what is, but then again, terror thought is made illegal by this act. This act is not just about what you put on the website, it's about what you say in a private conversation. So let me walk through it as quickly as I can. Part one is the information sharing provision. This also amends 17 different other acts, including the Fisheries and Oceans Act. You might wonder, what on earth would Section 4 of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Act possibly tell us about terrorist activity? Well, anything going on, the thesis wants to know, DFO must turn over all its documentation. You know, maybe someone from ISIS wants a drip net license. We, we, we want to know. Um, this, this is a section of the Act which includes the extraordinarily overbroad definition of activity that undermines the security of Canada. You've probably heard about this one. This is the section that actually says that it undermines the sovereignty, security, or territorial integrity of Canada, uh, and then it uses examples, such as interference with the capability of the government of Canada in relation to intelligence, defense, border operations, public safety, administration of justice, diplomatic or consular relations, or the economic or financial stability of Canada. Another subheading is interference with critical infrastructure. And at the end it says, for greater certainty, it does not include lawful advocacy, protest, dissent, and artistic expression. And despite my asking the Minister of Public Safety, Stephen Blade, the Justice Minister, Peter McKay, and the Prime Minister in the House, all of whom actually rose in response to my question, who does this exclude nonviolent civil disobedience? They just get up and charge. You can't read 10 men's never protect the violence. We do not include lawful advocacy. Right. So nonviolent civil disobedience is clearly not excluded by the fact. Activities that undermine the security of Canada, and this is a, this is a whole of government approach to sharing all the information they have about anybody they want to know about. No warrants are required, no one. Okay, moving on, part two of the act you've heard about, I'll skip over at this point, it's the no-fly list section. Part three of the act is really where the thought police come in. Part three of the act is amendments to the criminal code to deal with propaganda. Now, as Donald says, we're all supposed to be imagining this is a hateful propaganda that gets people riled up about killing people. But this is really weird language. Uh, this language is every person who, by communicating statements, knowingly advocates or promotes the commission of terrorism offenses in general. Now, not the law is person professors and and, or, by the way, a letter concerning this bill was also signed by four former prime ministers and I think six former chief justices of the Supreme Court of Canada. You can figure out what terrorism offenses in general mean. Uh, by the way, terrorist propaganda is defined as any writing, sign, visible representation, or audio recording that promotes, advocates or promotes the commission of terrorism offenses in general. It's all very bizarre. Now, Kent and Roche point out that unlike laws that we have against uh, expression, we already limit freedom of expression in a number of defined areas. Hate speech. It's illegal, you can be prosecuted. Child pornography offenses. It's illegal, you can be prosecuted. But there are statutory defenses to being in possession of some of this stuff. And any private conversations are excluded. This section does not include private conversations. It does not require any element of willful or knowingly participating. Uh, there are a number of examples one can think of. One of people who are currently fundraising in Canada to send help to Ukraine. Is that towards the commission of a terrorist act in general? Well, it certainly would be against the laws of a number of countries. Let me, I'm going to move quite smartly now to section four which expands thesis ability to monkey wrench. And don't quite right, C-44 and C-51 have to be seen together because up until C-44, thesis only existed to operate within Canada. Those who may remember what happened when the RCMP went rogue and burned down a barn in Quebec, we had the McDonald's Commission in 1984, said, so, you know, we've really got to separate out intelligence gathering from policing. These two things have to be kept separate. So CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, was created to be intelligence gathering only, within Canada only. <coughs> and by the way, one of the other big findings from our commission was the Air India Commission. Air India 
media look at this and says, the area of Commission McClure, said, we've got a problem here. The bombing of that plane, the loss of 390 lives, I don't know how many, some of you are too young to remember the area of the bombing, but it was, I think, 1984. And the, the bomb was placed on board the plane in, a, in Montreal Airport. And blew up in air. Vancouver Airport. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Air, Vancouver Airport. Left Montreal this morning. <laughs> Vancouver Airport. And Air India investigation discovered, of course, in the course of the investigation, RCMP had information about perpetrators. Researchers had information about perpetrators. Uh, they were hiding information from each other. They weren't coordinating properly. And so there were a lot of very clear recommendations about what should be done to ensure that these intelligence agencies coordinate. There's also very significant advice on how intelligence should operate in the wake of the Maher Arar scandal. And Mr. Justice O'Connor in the Arar situation said, we must have oversight. We must know what these agencies are doing and someone must be coordinating them. None of those recommendations have been put in place. And another omnibus bill that many of you will remember, Bill C-38, the omnibus budget bill that destroyed the Fisheries Act, the environmental assessment, you remember that one? It also eliminated the Inspector General for CISA, which was a, the only actual oversight. There is something called the Security Intelligence Review Committee, or CERT, but it's a part-time board of people who review post facto only some of what CSIS is doing. So now we have CSIS with, you know, we already in the, in the before C44 and before C51, the intelligence community and observers have been saying, compared to the EU, compared to the other countries with whom we share intelligence, it's called the five eyes, as in eyes, and it's the Canada, the US, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. Of all of those countries, Canada has the weakest oversight. We're the only country with no parliamentary oversight, and we got rid of the Inspector General. And now we're saying CSIS can operate outside of Canada. We are saying CSIS doesn't just collect information anymore. Now CSIS has an obligation, if there are under, this is under part four, if there are reasonable grounds to believe that a particular activity constitutes a threat to the security of Canada, the service may take measures within or outside Canada to reduce the threat. The thesis agents do not need to obtain a warrant to take action to reduce the threat unless they decide for themselves that their actions will violate the charter or that their actions will violate a domestic law. There does not seem to be any oversight of a thesis agent requiring a warrant to break a foreign law. When I pointed this out towards the House of Commons, I have the Parliamentary Secretary, Roxette James, after said, the member for Saturday's Island appears to think that the laws of Somalia are preferable to Canada's charter of rights and freedoms. How he got that out of what I asked, I can't believe. But anyway, uh, <laughs> what are the limits on the powers of chiefs of agents? Well, if they don't think they're going to violate the charter, and they're not, you have to have a fair degree of legal expertise to figure out something to violate the charter. Our Minister of Justice quite often disagrees with the Supreme Court of Canada about what the charter violates. CSIS agents are going to make this decision for themselves and decide if it's going to violate the charter, they'll go to a federal court judge for a warrant. Otherwise, they don't have to. If it's going to violate a domestic law, they need a warrant. They never have to report back to that judge how the warrant was executed, and they don't report to anyone else because there isn't adequate oversight. So the only limit in the legislation is this. In taking measures to reduce the threat to the security of Canada, the service shall not, A, cause intentionally or by criminal negligence death or bodily harm to an individual, B, willfully attempt in any manner to obstruct, pervert, or defeat the course of justice, or C, violate the sexual integrity of an individual. Those are their limits. Intentionally. Intent, yes. So, Accident. this is, this is, this is a police state law. This is to say we have minimal expectations of evidence and proof. We can expand the notion of what the threat to security of Canada. CSIS agents can do whatever they think is appropriate as long as they don't think it's going to violate the charter or break the domestic law to interfere with. And some things that they do, they can, they can ask for a warrant to both take things away from a place that they, are, that they have access by warrant or to install things. That's an interesting process. Why do they get installed? And I probably
probably should stop here. The, the main points about this are, again, if we were serious about, if this law was seriously focused on terrorism, the first question, can someone find a law enforcement aid, aid officer or a thesis agent who can find an example of where they lack the tools they need for investigation? As Donald just mentioned, the security certificate regime are very invasive. They suspend the rights of the accused to an alarming extent. Uh, but let's face it, RCMP officers have had the tools they needed to interfere with and disrupt and arrest the people in a couple of serious terrorist plots in Canada. And I'm glad they did. The Toronto 18, the Zia rail potential assault. The security and intelligence community itself has not complained they lack laws. But what this is is a combination, I believe, of a couple of things. Donald's absolutely right. These are chapter and verse. Over, essentially overturning what the Supreme Court has said they can and can't do by changing the law so they can use evidence obtained by torture. They don't need to worry about secret agents running them up or either in Canada or overseas. But what's extraordinary about this is that when you consider what we learned from things like the Air India investigation, what we learned from the investigation of Mahar Harar, we know that the intelligence and policing activities are best kept <laughs> separate and best kept with someone overseeing what they're doing. Um, it's quite clear that if this gets passed as is, it will not make us safer. It will definitely suspend civil liberties for people who are suspected of a wide range of nebulous threats to security. It will create a Chill on speech. This is another one of the areas where Kent wrote say, if you're trying to stop the radicalization of people, this is your real aim, you don't want to chill speech. You want people to continue to talk to someone who seems to be bent in the wrong direction. But the way this works is guilt by association, any kind of repetition, any kind of communication can be perceived as something that brings you into the scope of the 51 uh, measures that were uh, brought to us by Big Brother. I think it's the creation of a Franklin force. And what we, one last strategic point, and I'll sit down. I'm very grateful and pleased that uh, the official opposition at Tom Care opposed this bill. We need Trudeau to oppose it too. It's critical that the Liberals not vote for this thing because we're going to need to repeal it after the election. And that will become more difficult if one of the major parties has voted for it. So before I sit down, I want to thank Sarah for moderating this, and I want to thank the Young Greens of the University of Victoria for organizing it, and I'm sure we're all 